we're going to get started here with our first talk of this uh, early afternoon session. And I would just like you all to uh, help me welcome Melinda Shore here, who um, Thank you. Um, Melinda runs a cybersecurity consultancy, and she'll be talking about DNS. Hi. Um, as we, my name is Melinda Short. To be perfectly honest, this is my first PyCon, and I understand it's a little bit unusual to give talks here on net, what's basically network pro, uh, plumbing, network infrastructure. Um, but we've got a library that makes some new features in that plumbing available to uh, application developers and, and um, systems programmers. And so we thought we would come here and talk about it and also talk about why you should care because I think oftentimes information about what's going on uh, doesn't propagate up the stack. So the context for this is that we've got a library called GetDNS. Um, it's a new uh, DNS library supporting new DNS protocol features because there has been an awful lot of DNS protocol development been going on in the past several years. The library itself provides one-step DNSSEC validation. Um, it's asynchronous by default. It has transfer options to protect user privacy, avoid problems traversing what we call middle boxes, which are firewalls and NATs and other sorts of um, tr network transport intermediaries that sometimes cause difficulties for applications. So our goal is to make advanced DNS features available to application developers without <laughs> requiring you to know much about the protocol details. Um, it was a project that uh, was originally, the, the, the API was specified by Paul Hoffman, who now works for ICANN, and uh, Allison Mankin at VeriSign Labs put together a project to implement this um, API. And it's, it's involved uh, a, a fairly large team, um, a very international team, and a very skilled team. Uh, most of us are active in the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, which is where, uh, where protocols, network protocols are made and specified. So that's the context. Um, the original specification was for a C API. Uh, the data structures in the C API are, were very Pythonic, and so we thought, well, we could put a Python wrapper around this and get something that might be easier to use. And in fact, it's turned out to be really nice. Um, we've also got language bindings in addition to Python for Node and PHP, and there's some work going on on Ruby. Um, we've gone to a lot of hackathons and done extremely well there. I think the thing that we're proudest of so far in this project is that we won the best internet security improvement at um, an, a, an IETF hackathon in November. Um, anyway, so we we're now it's, feel like it's starting to reach maturity. Um, we've got some really interesting features in there, and we want to talk about it in public. Okay, so there are these changes in network plumbing. Oftentimes when this happens, they're invisible to users, but not always, in, not in this case. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how this can make your life a little bit easier. Uh, I, I've got a very, 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 very brief DNS tutorial. Um, I'm not sure how many people are already familiar with how the DNS actually works. Um, so I've, I've tried to keep it brief just, and provide just enough context for understanding some of the things that are bu being built on top of it. It's basically a stateless query response protocol. You send out a message, and it's stateless. It, um, a response comes back, and it has enough information for you to be able to put it together with your query. Um, what's, what are sent along and what are returned are called resource records. The structure, uh, it's basically an enormous distributed database. It is hierarchical. Um, the hierarchy is something that you're definitely familiar with. It starts at dot, which is the root zone. Then you've got the top level domains, which are .com, .org, .uk, and hundreds of others. Uh, second level domains include things like IETF. So you get IETF.org, Python.org, ISOC.org, EFF.org, and then subdomains like um, under Python, you've got mail, PyPy, WW, and so on. So what a query looks like is basically this. Um, by the way, I said which dig here because it shows that you've got dig on your Macs already. It, it comes with the operating system. So if you're interested in poking around the DNS and learning a little bit more about the structure of records and the data that come back, um, this is a good way to do it. Not as good as get DNS, but it's, but it's already on your Mac. Um, OK, so basically what we're doing here is we're saying dig get DNS API.net A, which means we're asking for an A record or an IPv4 address record for getDNSAPI.net. 
What comes back is the question that we ask, which is also circled here, um, along with uh, the answer. Excuse me, the answer is uh, circled. The, the question section is right above it. So basically, the answer that comes back is 185.49.141.37. Okay, so DNS, it's ubiquitous. It is everywhere. I mean, I think there, I know there are some of us who remember host.txt and, uh, and the host file being distributed by FTP, but, you know, that, that was decades ago, and now it's all dynamic, and it's being done through this distributed database uh, called DNS. Um, but it's not very secure. Uh, the stateless aspect of it makes it very easy for attackers to insert um, to insert traffic uh, and to do, commit what's called a, a cache poisoning attack in which they insert bogus answers into your DNS cache with obvious consequences. I mean, it means that they can redirect your traffic pretty easily. Uh, there are also things they can do along uh, doing denial of service attacks and so on. So um, DNSSEC was developed, which is a mechanism to prove the authenticity of a DNS record. It's, um, the trust model is based on the DNS uh, hierarchical structure. That is to say, you as somebody who owns a zone, a domain, you sign your own records, your key is signed by your parent zone, and so on up to the, to the root. Um, it uses public key cryptography, and I don't know how much, yeah, this is also, I don't know how much you know about crypto, but in public key cryptography, you've got two keys, one of which is public and one of which is private, and the basic network problem around uh, public key cryptography, uh, well, to, to back up a little bit, one of the great things about it is that you can publish your public key and make it available, which means that you don't need a pre-existing relationship with somebody else. You don't need to pre-provision keys. It has nice scaling properties, and it's really nice. The problem is that, you know, I could say, here's my public key, I'm Angela Merkel. And, of course, I'm not. So um, there needs to be a mechanism to protect that identity. Uh, the way it's usually handled is to have somebody trusted vouch for the public key and say, yes, you really are Angela Merkel, or, although I'm not, or Melinda Shore. Um, and they sign it using their own, own keys. Uh, generally, the PKI is hierarchical. DNSSEC is hier hierarchical. Some of you may have be using PGP or OpenPGP, and that is a dis that's a, a slightly different model. That's people vouching for each other, and it, it's um, it's more of a, a, a graph structure than uh, than a tree. So here's a DNSSEC example. Um, in the query, I've said dig plus DNSSEC get DNS API A get the get the IPv4 address, and what comes back is. Uh, the address and a signature, and there are additional records containing public keys that I can use to validate that signature and prove that it, um, the person who, or the entity that generated that signature does in fact have the private key associated with that domain. Okay, so the first thing we do is we've got uh, this new library, GetDNS, that makes it very, very easy to do DNSSEC validation. You don't have to know anything about crypto. You don't have really, even really have to know anything about DNS. Um, so here, I've, there's a, a very short script, simple.py. We're importing get DNS and sys. Uh, get DNS queries have a context. So the first thing you do is create a, DNA, a get DNS context. We create a, a dictionary called, containing extensions, and we ask get DNS to return only secure records. Um, then we generate a, an address query by saying, you know, doing context.address um, on the argument that's passed into the script. And then all we do is if we got a, a good response, um, if the, we got rest status good, we just walk through the addresses and we know that everything there is valid under, D, valid under DNSSEC. Um, there are, there's additional data that comes back as well if you want a greater level of detail, but, you know, as, as you can see, this is extremely simple. Um, so there I run it get, against getDNSAPI.net, we get our addresses, I run it against Google.com. Um, Google doesn't uh, use DNSSEC to, uh, to protect their DNS records, um, they've opted not to. So we're looking at this and we're saying, well, DNSSEC protects public keys for, for DNS, can it protect other stuff? It, this, it securely serves up public keys, and is, is this a new trust model for the internet? Um, 
And so the answer is yes. Uh, OK, so backing up a little bit to PKI, as I talked about earlier, you've got to trust somebody. The way PKI works is that you're, you know, typically you're, you've got trust roots in, that come pre-configured with your browser. And any certificate that you get during a TLS section should chain back up to a, um, to a certificate that's in your root trust store. Um, so that means that browser vendors are the ones who are making decisions about who to trust and who, who not to, and that hasn't always worked out well. They need to be authentic, the um, public keys, and the people who are using them, which is you, need to be able to prove authenticity. So some of the things that we've been running into are certificate misissuance. Um, for a very common example is somebody issuing certificates for domains that the applicant doesn't own. This happened with Turk Trust, which is a fairly high profile um, example. And if it chains back up to somebody who's already in your, in your uh, root trust store, the certificate's going to be valid, even though it belongs to somebody else. Anyway, we've also been running into um, careless key usage constraints, which is um, certificate uh, uh, certification authorities um, issuing certificates that have the CA bit set, which allows the person with that certificate to act as a certification authority themselves and issue certificates. Um, we've also had problems with compromised CAs. And one example that's getting a lot of press this week is the blue coat situation. H have you guys heard about this? Yeah, it's um, blue coat is a is a they make network intermediaries. They make network intermediation devices, kind of like firewalls. But they, it's um, Reporters Without Borders in 2013 identified blue coat as an enemy of the internet because their devices can terminate and reoriginate traffic, which allows um, authoritarian regimes to censor. Uh, to, to censor what the people in their domain see, and to also to um, extensive surveillance on their citizens. Um, some of their customers have included people like Syria and Iran, uh, China, and so on. So one thing that happened this spring that was only discovered recently is that Symantec, which is one of the largest certification authorities, issued a CA cert to Blue Coat. Um, Blue Coat says they won't be using it. We can believe them or not, but the, the issue remains that somebody, something similar could happen with somebody else, and um, we wouldn't know about it. I mean, the, the basic issue is that if you go out to Google.com, Blue Coat can issue their own certificate for Google.com and redirect you or censor what you're seeing or whatever. It's, it'll terminate your TLS section and reoriginate one so that it looks real or, or not. Um, but basically, there's a problem with censorship and surveillance here. So this is a problem that's built into the PKI. We know about it, and we're trying to do something about it with a number of different efforts in the IETF. Um, one of those is called DAIN, which is DNS-based authentication of named entities. We like clever acronyms, um, even if it, <laughs> even to the, it's, you know, it makes things ugly um, in reality, but uh, DAIN, is easy to pronounce even if DNS-based authentication of named entities is not. Um, okay, here's the idea. People are running their own DNS servers. They've got DNSSEC protection of their records, so why not give them control over what certificates are issued to represent them, right? So that um, when you do a TLS session, you can retrieve the TLS TLS certificate from, uh, from their DNS store and match it against what you received on the TLS connection rather than having to trust some certification authority. You still have the problem of who to trust, but intuitively it's a lot more comfortable to trust what a domain says about their own certificates than what some um, third party with a commercial interest says about their own certificates. So, um, Basi the implementation is basically put public key credentials in the DNS protected by DNSSEC. For TLS, these, um, these credentials are, uh, they're called TLSA records and they contain um, TLS certificates and entity certificates, cert uh, server certs. Um, okay, so basically to um, authenticate TLS servers, retrieve a TLSA record from the DNS, 
make sure its signature checks out, compare the certificate you received with the one that you received from the server in the server hello. And in get DNS, it looks like we make, we make a query for a um, TLSA record because the, the context.general method allows retrieval of arbitrary uh, record types. Get the server cert the same way you currently would. We've been using M2 crypto um, because we, it's at, this, at the time that we were looking, which was about two, two years ago, a year and a half ago, M2 crypto really had the best interface, the most complete interface to certificate services. Um, pull data out of the record. This looks like a lot of lines, and it, it, it's a lot of lines because that's a lot of data, but you can see that it's not doing anything particularly sophisticated there. Um, compare it with what you've got, and either it matches or it doesn't. Um, we have a ton of sample code up on, in our GitHub repo. Um, other Dain applications include open PGP keys, SMIME keys, and people are now using TLSA to protect SMTP sessions. Uh, in particular, in Germany, there's been very, very broad deployment of, of TLSA records um, and valid ones as well. Um, we've got, also got an example of code that um, we're calling it Dane Encrypt, and um, we're using SMIME certificates to encrypt email. Uh, re based on certificates that are stored in a t TLSA record. There's now an open PGP type. Um, and since we're running a little bit short, uh, I thought I'd move ahead to DNS privacy. Um, after the revelations about Sn Edward Snowden came out, uh, the IETF took a good hard look at what was going on and uh, published I uh, RFC 7258, which says that pervasive monitoring is a technical attack on the network. And it, um, we're taking great care uh, now to protect protocols against po possible privacy leaks. Uh, this is, includes encryption, but it's not limited to encryption. There's a lot of metadata out there that you know, where observers can make inferences about what users are doing based on, uh, on their behavior. DNS in particular leaks a massive amount of information about what a user is doing in the network. So, um, in parallel with uh, protocol development work in the IETF, we've been um, implementing this in GetDNS. That includes things like um, adding TLS, uh, TLS transport, the, um, the RFC specifying the use of, of TLS for DNS transport was just published a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've implemented it already. It's available on a few servers, but not many. Uh, we've also added optional padding so that an observer cannot tell how large your query is and so on. Um, also, just as a quick note on roadblock avoidment, avoidance, uh, middle boxes such as firewalls and NATs um, sometimes filter out DNS traffic that they think is, is hinky. Um, so we've got mechanisms to work around these. This is completely transparent to the programmer. This is not something that you would need to do anything to use, but you should know it's there. Okay, current status. We're now feature complete with respect to the original API spec, and we've got ongoing integration of new protocol features uh, as they're being issued by the IETF. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we've been really, really happy about using Python for doing this is that it's been incredibly quick to prototype new protocol features um, in the DNS using this. I mean, on the order of hours, you can just sit down at the REPL, construct a packet, and, and push it out, and, you're, and, um, and there you go. So that's been a really wonderful feature. So we've got the project homepage is uh, getDNSAPI.net. Um, we've got the GitHub repo, uh, PyPy, I put together a Docker image, and I, actually I'm really interested in feedback on this. Um, some people have found it difficult to build the bindings because of dependencies, particularly dependency on libgit DNS. Uh, and so I put together a Docker image, and it, it's seen very little download, not nearly as much download as the, um, as the source code itself. And if people feel strongly one way or another about using Docker for this sort of thing, I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing your feedback. Okay, we've got a mailing list. Uh, please feel free to join it. And it, we've got an upcoming hackathon in July in Berlin, and uh, we're going to have a team there as usual. 
Uh, and we're looking, you know, we'd, we're really looking for participation from application developers about what kinds of things that they'd like to see to help them secure their protocols using some of this technology. So um, please feel free to, to drop us a line and get involved. You do not need to be in, uh, registered for the IETF meeting or participating in the IETF meeting. You just need to be there. It's a, a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, some of the things we've got in mind include uh, a get DNS protocol for Twisted, um, a, a Dane API so that you don't even have to know as much as I showed you right there. You don't have to do any of the crypto stuff yourself or use the M2 crypto interface or whatever ideas you may have as well. It's, uh, it's a very, very open process. And that's the URL for the hackathon itself. Um, that's my Twitter handle. And do people have questions? Yeah, could I please ask uh, folks to line up at the microphone and remember to answer, ask questions. And thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, There's no sound from that mic, eh? Microphone on, there we go. Um, Firefox ships with its own cert store, I think. Yeah. Um, other browsers kind of defer to the OS, or maybe they ship some on their own. If you don't check the integrity of that download, then are you kind of opening yourself up to a bunch of vulnerabilities? I'm sorry, I can't hear that. So um, the, the authentication, like the, you're talking about PKI, um, so you've got some root cert that you're going to trust. Right. Um, and that root cert is embedded in like the Firefox download. Right. So when you're downloading that Firefox download, you need to make sure that you're not getting a malicious copy um, that has an incorrect root cert store. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have like a chicken and egg problem here. How do you resolve that? The, uh, yeah, that, um, well, there's a couple of things going on actually in that space. There's the, um, first up, you know, we, we're, we assume that Mozilla is making good decisions about what ends up in the search store, and generally they have. But there are incidents where a CA is compromised, um, or the, or they've made a mistake, and uh, there needs to be the ability to respond to that. So, the the root trust store is, yeah. I mean, that's there, as I said. There's a, there's a bunch of different stuff going on around that right now. Include I don't know if you've heard about the certificate transparency project, which allows you to audit what you're seeing and make sure that other people are seeing the same thing. Um, and we're also doing some work around that uh, on this project as well, but it wasn't relevant to this talk. Uh, this, it, this is a little bit different. You know, right now, one of the things that's been delaying implementing this kind of thing in Firefox and in other browsers is that um, it, it, it introduces additional latency into session startup, right? Because you're, when you, you're having to do a bunch of DNS queries. So one of the, another thing we're doing is uh, a, a TLS protocol extension that allows um, the server to send down the entire DNSSEC validation chain along with the certificate. And that was just accepted as a TLS working group deliverable. Um, and I've actually got an application into Moss for funding to support this, to implementing it. Um, so there's movement, you know, right now, uh, it's, this is a very transitional time and, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm hoping that, you know, the, the Chrome guys are involved in this as well, so. Uh, yeah, I really in, uh, like the idea of Dane. It sounds awesome. Uh, my question was along the lines of what you just said. What sort of timeline um, do you think we would see before we see it in any of the major browsers? Um, yeah, the, uh, I think you know. I'm I'm hoping that we can actually have a beta. Uh, I'm hoping we can have something out in Firefox and within about six months or so that will do the DNSSEC extension and that'll enable Dane and DNSSEC and, and some of these other technologies. Right now, I mean, the browser vendors are so sensitive to latency and you can't blame them, so. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the blue coat um, CA, sorry, could that then further issue more CA certificates? And what would be the repercussions if that sort of got out? This specific certificate cannot 
issue additional CA certificates because it's got, um, I don't know how much you guys know about PKI and, and what's in the X509 certs, but it's got, a, it's got a path length of zero, which means that it can only issue um, end entity certificates. But, you know, this is, the attack is a, a broad one and somebody else could, in, you know, issue one with no path length, which means that anybody under them could, you know, they could issue CA certificates. Right now, this specific, specific certificate cannot. I guess, what would the protocol be if something somewhere under the semantic tree leaked with that ability? Would that invalidate everything up to the top? I'm sorry? If somewhere under semantics tree, uh, the SCA with no path line was leaked, would that, would they generally then have to invalidate everything up to the top? Um, what, what happens is uh, it's, the path length is ch checked as part of the validation and it starts at the bottom and as soon as you hit a, a, an invalid path length, you're done. It's no longer valid. So um, typically CA certificates do not contain path lengths, I believe, um, but I'm not really sure. I mean, it's, it's not really that heavily used, that particular field. Uh, so we were kind of surprised to see it in the, in the blue coat cert and it was just one of these things that makes you wonder what the heck they're doing and why they would issue a certificate that looked like that. Hey, uh, quick question. Um, so you said that uh, you have to trust somebody um, and currently we have the CA uh, trust system. Um, with DNSSEC, uh, it wasn't entirely clear to me who we're trusting there yes. and why they are more trustworthy than the current uh, checks and balances we have. Sure. Typically, when you uh, DNSSEC, a DNSSEC record is going to be signed by a zone, that, you know, a domain by the domain that owns. I mean, basically, you're going to be signing your own records, right? Your key is going to be signed by your parent zone and so on up to the um, up to the the, the root zone, and um, this, this, this is an intuitive thing. I don't think you can really prove it, but the assumption here is that people are going, not, people are going to be disinclined to make false assertions about their own records, right? And they're not going, you know, if I'm, if I'm no mountain.net, I cannot make assertions about google.com because it won't validate. Right? So there's a little, it's, it's a little bit cleaner, but again, the, you know, the assumption is that a, a CA is going to tend to be a, more problematic to deal with in terms of validating signatures and in terms of legitimacy of relationship um, than, than uh, you are about yourself. I mean, how, if you are um, blah.co.uk, how, how would a you know, .com uh, how would a CA in the .com domain be entitled to um, issue certificates to you? I mean, how is anybody entitled to to, uh, to issue certificates to you? That's a, that's the basic problem here. Is you know we don't really know what the rela relationships are when a certificate is issued. We you know we can assume that the a, a CA has good practice, but that's really a business question and not a technical one. So if I have a .io, for instance, then uh is that as trustworthy as having a, a CA cert that's maybe in the Firefox store? Well, it's um, you're going to be you're going to be making assertions about your own records, uh, and you're not going to be making assertions about anybody else's records because they won't validate, right? Um, whereas a, uh, a commercially purchased certificate from a CA, um, we don't know what the relationship between you and them is, or, or if it, it's even valid. You, you know, there there have been instances of CAs issuing Microsoft.com certificates and Google.com certificates to entities other than Microsoft and Google. Um, and there's no way in the PKI system, well, there are name constraints, but they're not heavily used. But you know, the, it's, it's, the current PKI system doesn't really support expressing that relationship, and, which is a trust one. Okay, thanks. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I'll be around afterwards if people wanna, if people wanna chat. Um, is there some responsible group or entity or volunteer project or something that's monitoring the collective set of CA certificates that are going out with all the browsers and the JVMs and everything? Yeah, there's something called the CAB forum, the CA and browser forum, and they tend to um, be the ones who are setting policy around this stuff. Uh, it's, of course, compliance is always voluntary.
right? And since the incentives for behaving badly are, are pretty high, we need mechanisms to, um, number one, mitigate those, and, and number two, monitor those, which is, and the latter of which is what certificate transparency is all about. So anyway, um, I will put the slides up somewhere and, and tweet it um, and make those available so that you'll have the URLs to get the software. Uh, and as I said, I'm really curious about how you all feel about Docker and um, what facilities you would find useful as applications and developers and systems programmers. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.